very significant story for the peninsula and really for California in the West. Um, if you can imagine, um, California was only born 14 years before uh, the railroad was extended uh, down in San Jose. Okay. The actual railroad uh, that started on the peninsula was, of course, the San Francisco and San Jose Railway. And it had been on its fourth reorganization before work actually commenced in 1860, and uh, work started at Palo Alto both ways at uh, San Francisco Creek, I believe. Um, if you can imagine what the San Francisco looked like in 1850, um, this improvement by 1864 was um, not even imaginable. Uh, in uh, that famous year of 1849, transportation uh, down the peninsula consisted of stagecoach service uh, and, um, and some um, um, uh, paddle wheel boats that could um, maneuver down the bay. Uh, but stagecoach service was such that it was very expensive, $32 in that year of 1849, and also very slow. It takes nine hours to get from San Francisco to San Jose, and that was when uh, conditions were pretty good. Uh, and so um, the idea of a commute, of course, was completely out. And uh, even the, the, the basics of transportation uh, was not in good order. San Jose was a long way from San Francisco. The journey was not one to be lightly undertaken, as there was no road worthy of the name. You might spend hours roaming around in search of a passable route, and just when you thought you'd found one, the fog would roll in. Then you had a gloomy choice to make. You could keep going and probably spend the night driving blindly around in circles, or you could just stay put until the ceiling lifted the next morning. Such was El Camino Real between California's metropolis and its new capital when the first legislature met near the close of 1849, King's Highway of the Spanish Days. Little work had been done on it since. Furthermore, any improvements seemed to matter for the far distant future. County treasuries had no funds for roads, despite all California's gold. That was going east almost as fast as it came down from the mountains. Even the legislature was something of a gamble, for California was not yet formally a state. How grand it would be, said the travel-worn Solons as they assembled, were there only a railroad north to the big city. San Jose, you see at the time, in 1850, was uh, state capital. And so there was a clamor in uh, San Francisco and throughout California uh, that um, there'd be a linkage of San Francisco and San Jose uh, through rail. Uh, rail was the most efficient kind of transportation being pioneered now on the East uh, Coast, and a similar kind of transportation now is desirable for the, for the West. And don't forget, this is uh, the completion of San Francisco San Jose Railroad was. Uh, uh, five years in front of the Transcontinental Railroad. So this was progressive thinking. And it began um, actually in that year of 1850 um, when uh, business interests in San Francisco began to uh, talk about the possibilities of linking San Francisco and San Jose. And there were um, three tries uh, before finally the San Francisco San Jose Railroad was uh, incorporated in 1860 to get this uh, moving. In July 1860, a fourth and final company was born. Again, a president was provided by the bench, Judge Timothy Dame, but the real power in the new setup was the secretary, Peter Donahue. Donahue was a 49er who had found more riches in iron than in gold. A few weeks in the gold fields had been quite enough for him. The close of 1849 found Peter Donahue back in San Francisco, running California's first foundry and machine shop in a tent on Montgomery Street. From this tiny air-conditioned start, had grown the great Union Ironworks, humming with prosperity at First and Mission Streets. Henry Newall, his good friend and the city's leading auctioneer, joined him in the venture. These three, the mechanic, the auctioneer, and the judge, proceeded finally with a few associates to build the San Francisco and San Jose Railroad. Uh, they uh, were able to get private subscription, subscription to be able to construct the railroad, but very importantly was um, uh, some tax money that was going to come their way. And the people of San Francisco, San Mateo, and Santa Clara County uh, voted uh, bond monies for this project. Uh, 300000 from San Francisco, 100000 from San Mateo, and 200000 from uh, Santa Clara County. 
and uh, this made construction uh, possible. At first, construction went very well. Um, you know, uh, track was uh, laid uh, down uh, uh, pretty rapidly, and uh, many felt that uh, there would be an early completion to the railroad. But several things got in the way. Um, uh, uh, severe winters uh, slowed down construction, but the most important aspect of uh, delay uh, was the Civil War. It made um, the getting of iron very difficult. Uh, other kinds of materials um, were hard to get. And uh, this did uh, delay the construction a bit. But when you think that uh, this, this project still was completed within uh, three years, well, four years, that uh, this is still pretty good progress. Uh, the San Francisco San Jose Railroad um, experimented for the first time with railroads, anyways, uh, the use of Chinese labor and uh, proved successful. And this was a lesson that Governor Stanford uh, did not uh, ignore. And then when it came time for, um, for him and his uh, three partners, the Big Four, uh, to um, put forward this transcontinental railroad, the lessons learned by the San Francisco San Jose Railroad and the use of Chinese labor um, was well, well put. I mean, you have to remember that the Civil War was going on, uh, and those that uh, weren't being taken up by the service uh, were in various kinds of industries um, that were essential to not just the war effort, but to keep California's economy uh, going. And so uh, labor was um, uh, difficult. When the San Francisco to San Jose Railroad was completed, it was actually California's third railroad. Uh, but um, really, uh, this San Francisco to San Jose Railroad uh, was uh, the first to be a real substantial railroad, and probably the first that you could qualify as a commuter railroad. As those that were creating the Industrial Revolution uh, desired to get their families out of the squalor of the 19th century city, uh, the railroad tracks were allowing them to do that. Uh, there was a party uh, in October of 1863 uh, to mark the occasion that the railroad had made it from San Francisco to Mayfield, which is in today's Palo Alto. And then in January of 1864, rails were completed to San Jose. The route is nearly straight. There are no formidable hills. The distance from the summit of the mountain to the bay is not more than 10 miles, and our climate is so dry that in ordinary years, scarcely a stream which crossed by the road contains enough water to drive a mill. The principal creeks commencing at the north are Islas, Cupertino, San Mateo, Redwood, San Francisco, and Guadalupe. The latter is honored with the name of river. While the road is not so crooked as most of the roads in the eastern states, it is still far from straight. In the first seven miles from the mission, the longest straight stretches a mile. For five miles out from the mission, the general course is a little west of south until the bank of the San Bruno Mountain is turned, to adopt a military phrase, and thence the course is southeast, with many straight stretches three or four miles long. At the point of the San Bruno Mountain, the wide Pacific Ocean, distant two miles, is visible, with its rolling surf from the cars and, looking northward, we see the steep coast and mountains beyond the Golden Gate. After passing the San Bruno Mountain, we are almost constantly in sight of the bay. The hills are entirely bare until we reach the 17-mile house, where chaparral and evergreen oak appear in the canyons and hollows. At San Mateo, we see deciduous oaks and a few bay trees in the plain. Near Belmont, we see the comb of the mountain, or Sierra, serrated with the tall redwood trees, and beyond Redwood City, we pass through a dense natural grove of deciduous oak trees, hanging full of gray moss and mistletoe, with an abundant undergrowth of the poison roose, the leaves of which are now red, and ready to fade. Daily Alta, California, October 18th, 1863. They got the railroad pretty much up and running in about 1868, but actually 1864, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, Southern Pacific, well actually the big four, uh, Huntington, uh, Stanford, uh, Crocker, and uh, uh, Hopkins, they uh, had their finger in the pie quite early. And, by 1868, they had already pretty much were in control of the railroad. It was formalized in 1870, and so from that point forward, they were running this railroad between San Francisco and San Jose. And um, the railroad became a success. They did a freight service, and it's the second oldest railroad 
in west of the Mississippi. The commuter service was established and it went from there to what we have today, a double track line with signals, modern signal system and a railroad that's carrying 50,000 passengers a day. Uh, when I commuted on it after the World War II, it was carrying 20,000 a day. So this railroad has come a long ways.